Welcome to Chapter 8. Here we will focus on mechanisms of protein regulation and degradation, beginning with isozymes. So isozymes are enzymes that differ in amino acid sequence but catalyze the same chemical reaction. In many cases, isozymes are coded for by homologous genes that have been duplicated within the genome and have then diverged over time. However, they can also evolve from convergent evolution as well and be completely unrelated in the sequence level. In both cases, isozymes are expressed from different genes. They are not allelic variations of the same gene. Isozymes usually display different kinetic parameters, such as different KM values or KCAT values, or they have different regulatory properties. The existence of isozymes permits the fine-tuning of metabolism to meet the particular needs of a given tissue or developmental stage. Next term, we will see isozymes and how they affect the metabolism of sugars. In this lesson, we will focus on the cyclooxygenase enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2. These are both isozymes of one another. Cyclooxygenase enzymes are bifunctional enzymes that mediate the cyclooxygenase and the peroxidase reactions that convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2. The first reaction, the cyclooxygenase reaction, is shown here. The prostaglandins are a group of physiologically active lipid compounds called eicosanoids that have diverse hormone-like effects in animals. Prostaglandins have been found in almost every tissue in humans and other animals, and they are derived enzymatically from the fatty acid, arachidonic acid. Every prostaglandin contains 20 carbon atoms, including a 5-carbon ring. Thus, they are a subclass of the eicosanoids. Recall that eicos means 20. In the second half of the reaction, the peroxidase portion of the cyclooxygenase enzyme will mediate the conversion of prostaglandin G2 into prostaglandin H2. As you can see here, you're having the reduction of this peroxide into the alcohol functional group. Note that this is a redox enzyme. Prostaglandin H2 may then be modified by other variations by additional enzymes. Some of these different variations are shown here, such as other prostaglandins, the prostacyclins, and the thromboxanes. So prostaglandins are implicated then in various physiological processes, such as gastrointestinal cytoprotection, hemostasis and thrombosis, as well as renal hemodynamics. Through their role in vasodilation, the prostaglandins are also involved in inflammation and can trigger the onset of a fever or the sensation of pain. They are synthesized in the walls of the blood vessels and they serve the physiological function of preventing needless clot formation, as well as regulating the contraction of smooth muscle tissue. Due to their role in mediating inflammatory and fever response within the body, COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes are targets for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or the NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen. The COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes share about 65% sequence homology, and they have nearly identical catalytic sites. Both enzymes have three domains, and both form dimers and they are often found attached to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Note that the COX-2 enzyme is predominantly responsible for inflammation and fever response in the body, whereas COX-1 is involved with the regulation of the GI tract mucus production and smooth muscle contraction. Standard NSAIDs, or first-generation NSAIDs, will bind to both COX-1 and COX-2 equally, as shown here in blue. Essentially, the active site becomes blocked and arachidonic can no longer bind with the enzyme. Most NSAIDs are irreversible inhibitors that will bind with the enzyme covalently and permanently block the activity. And note that the inhibition of COX-2 can prevent inflammation and pain. 
However, inhibition of COX-1 at the same time can lead to gastrointestinal upset if the NSAIDs are taken for long periods of time. In fact, they can lead to the formation of ulcers as the production of the protective mucosa within the stomach is reduced. The next generation NSAIDs are COX-2 specific inhibitors. There was a lot of fanfare over this class of inhibitors in the beginning as they were hoped to reduce the gastrointestinal side effects without compromising the reduction in inflammation and pain. However, they ended up having some unintended cardiovascular side effects not seen with the standard NSAID classes. Here's a diagram showing some of the selectivity of the current NSAIDs. Notice that the standard over-the-counter NSAIDs are pretty much here in the middle and will inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes at about the same level. Note that aspirin also will inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes as well in a similar way to ibuprofen. COX-2 specific inhibitors are represented by the compounds celecoxib and diclofenac to a lesser extent. Note that Keterolac is also listed on this slide and it has more selectivity for COX-1. However, it still can inhibit the COX-2 enzyme as well and it's used for pain and inflammatory inhibition after surgery. So as with many systems inside the body, it turns out that the inhibition of COX-1 and COX-2 becomes complicated in vivo and affects many different systems. COX-1 in the GI system is normally involved with increasing mucus secretion, increasing bicarbonate production, which aids in pH stabilization, and increases mucosal blood flow. Thus, if you inhibit COX-1, this can lead to the development of peptic ulcers and GI bleeding. Long-term inhibition of both COX-1 and COX-2 can also negatively impact the kidneys, which is another reason that COX-2 selective inhibitors were sought. However, COX-2 is also involved in vasodilation and inhibits platelet aggregation, acting as a blood thinner. However, notice that COX-1 activity is the opposite of that of COX-2 when it comes to the cardiovascular system. COX-1 is involved in vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation. Thus, low dose levels of aspirin is actually protective against heart attacks and strokes as it inhibits COX-1 at lower doses a little bit more than the COX-2 enzyme. However, if you have a selective COX-2 inhibitor and end up inhibiting COX-2 a lot more than the COX-1 enzyme, you may reduce inflammation and get rid of the GI tract side effects, but you increase platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction, which then increases your overall chance for heart attacks and strokes. Thus, most of the COX-2 specific inhibitors have been removed from the market due to this concern. Overall, this story highlights the importance of differential product formation in different locations in the body by isozymes. In the next section, we will have an introduction to the different types of post-translational modifications that can also be used to regulate protein activity.